Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. We have um, a long afternoon um, that we have broken into panels, and I want to tell you what the framework of the day is, and then we'll jump in. We have two policy panels that we will do in the morning. Um, the first will focus on policy around telehealth and te health IT, and then we'll be focusing a little bit more in on really cutting edge technology, what the future of telemonitoring looks like, and what that can mean to you all. We will take a break, but the break won't be until after the first two policy panels are done. So at about 2.30 is the break. Clearly, if you need to get up, stretch your legs, walk outside the room, feel free at any point, but we will have a formal break at 2.30. After the break, we're going to come back and have a, a town hall style conversation. Our, the panel's goal for today is to really make this as engaging as possible. So throughout, we'll really be looking to have a conversation with you about your experiences, what you're experiencing in your agencies, questions for the panelists. But we'll designate all of the time after the break for a really robust conversation. So that'll be at the end. The goals of this session are to really ensure that everyone has a deep understanding about health IT, telehealth, and adoption to identify the policy and practice barriers and identify real enablers and solutions for agencies in terms of implementing health IT and telehealth, to hear about the cutting edge technology and how it's being implemented, and to discuss your experiences, what's working and what isn't, and to really lift up any innovations that you can share with us. So I'd like to do some opening framing, but before that, let me just dive in with you for a second so we can understand who you are. With a show of hands, how many of you are the IT person in your agency? Okay. No, but that's what we wanted to know. If you guys, if you all were the ones implementing the EHRs, it's a really different conversation than if you're not, right? So how many of you have a, would say you have a deep, at least, knowledge of what your agency uses for health IT and the implementation barriers and opportunities? A, a good part of the room, that's great. How many of you would say you have no idea at all what we're even talking about about telehealth? <laughs> so for the most part, I would say this audience has a good passing understanding of health IT, of telehealth. Um, and we're all, I think, coming from it from a more executive, administrative policy angle than we are from a, uh, an implementer sitting there typing and coding, which um, I think level sets for us so that we know how, um, how to focus our comments a little better. Um, anything else you guys want to know from the people in the room? Good. So. As we take your questions um, throughout the day, we will ask you to identify yourself, but also um, if you could share with us a little bit ab ab about who you are and your experience with telehealth as you ask your questions, I think that'll really help us um, make sure we're, we keep really on point with how we're talking about um, these topics, and that'll help throughout the day. So I am going to take just a few minutes um, to talk about what's happening and why we're even having this session. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what VNAA has been doing in the telehealth space, what's happening in Washington, and why this conversation is so timely. And the short answer is telehealth and health IT is pretty hot in Washington right now. Policymakers are really talking about it. They are at the administration level, they are thinking of what federal agencies can do to address any barriers and to encourage adoption and use of telehealth. Congress is really involved in this, which, you know, it can be a little scary when Congress gets involved, but they are doing a lot to promote telehealth, to promote health IT, and to incentivize its use. This is consistent with the goals of delivery system reform that have been set out in the Affordable Care Act. This is consistent with the high-tech provisions and the meaningful use incentive programs that were passed a few years ago and are being implemented. And all of these disparate p 
pieces are coming together to really create an atmosphere of change and innovation in Washington. And it's really exciting and it's a good time to be doing policy in this work. And at the same time, you have the actual development and innovation of health IT accelerating at such a rapid pace that everywhere you look, there is new and exciting innovation and then the policy eh, lags behind a little bit but mirrors it as well. For the purposes of this conversation, we are talking broadly both about health IT and more narrowly about telehealth and even more narrowly about remote patient monitoring. They are um, statutorily different sometimes in terms of the way Medicare will reimburse, in terms of the way they are integrated into delivery system models and the way that they work. We will try to be as specific as we can between the distinctions, but shorthand, we're talking about all of these things and telehealth and health IT and remote patient monitoring. The lines do get blurred a little bit, but do know that they are, they are designated in slightly different buckets depending on what you're talking about. VNAA has been deeply engaged in this and um, really monitoring the policy trends and looking for the unique opportunity to lift up the voice of home health and hospice throughout. And I have been so lucky to work with the VNAA staff as we figure out how to represent your interests. You know, the, the home health and hospice agencies, we weren't included in the meaningful use incentives, which has created some unique challenges. But despite that, all of your agencies and home health in general have really been in the vanguard of adoption despite not being included in that incentive program, which is really a testament to the fact that you know so well what telehealth can do in improving patient outcomes. And so what we have been doing at the VNAA is really trying to bring that to light to make sure home health and hospice will always have a seat at the table in the future and why we're so excited to be pulling your collective wisdom so we can share that in Washington. A couple notes on, just quickly on the last actually 10 days in Washington, um, you may have heard that the sustainable growth rate bill, the SGR, the doctor Be Medicare payment bill, it, it got repealed last week, ending a decades long cycle of crazy politics. Um, we, you'll hear more about that throughout the conference, but I do just wanna highlight that it did include some interesting provisions on telehealth and health IT. Um, including affirmative language, for example, that there is nothing to prohibit the, pay, the reimbursement for telehealth under advanced payment models like ACOs. It opens the door to HHS being able to think through those options. Um, it's admittedly weak language, but it is there and it is a proactive step towards getting to where we all want to be in terms of reimbursement policy. So that's, um, it's good news. The Senate tomorrow, um, making us look extremely timely, is actually having a big hearing on telehealth. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a congressional hearing, it's a dog and pony show, but it really does demonstrate, and the witnesses that they have lined up, the real cl congressional intent to be, to be proactive in telehealth and to do what they can. So tomorrow there's this great Senate hearing happening. The House is also interested in telehealth, but they unfortunately have taken a slight step backwards and have indicated that they will not be including strong telehealth language um, in, one of their, in one of their flagship bills, this 21st century cures piece that is likely to be moving forward. So it's an interesting tension between the House and the Senate, and they were just talking about that last week. See, um, I offer this as a flavor of why this conversation is so timely. I offer it as context to the important remarks you'll hear and as a framing for where policy is going. Um, we can dive in deeper later in the afternoon in the politics, if that's helpful. It is interesting politics, but a little off topic. So I'm not gonna get into that now, but I'm happy to answer questions at any point on that. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn to our first panel to open us up. Um, Liz Polina Hall, um, I'll let her talk a little bit about her role within the ONC, but we are so lucky to have her with us today. She is a nurse by background and she currently serves as the long-term and post-acute care coordinator on the policy team for the Office of the National Coordinator on Health IT, the ONC. She 
In this role, she coordinates across all of the offices within ONC and across all of the HHS uh, to advance health IT adoption and interoperability across the whole care continuum, including across LTAC providers um, and individuals receiving care in these settings. And she brings just um, such a tremendous perspective, and we're really lucky that she was able to make this trip. After Liz, Renee will present. And Renee Kwashi is a senior counsel at Epstein Baker in Green's Washington, D.C. office. He focuses his practice on a number of issues, including specifically telehealth regulatory and policy issues, which brings exactly what we need to frame out this conversation today. In the telehealth space, Mr. Kwashi represents health systems, hospitals, regional telehealth networks, physicians, and technology companies for implementing new models of healthcare delivery. So we'll give them each an opportunity to, prepare, to present their prepared remarks, and then after that, we'll have the opportunity to really dive in with them and prepare your questions. Um, so with that, Liz. So um, just to, again, provide a little context for you all who uh, may not be quite familiar with who ONC is, uh, we are part of the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. We're located within the Office of the Secretary. And uh, we coordinate um, and advance uh, the health IT efforts within the department um, and to include the um, advancement of electronic health information exchange. Um, we were established by the Health, health High Tech Act in uh, 2009, and we have a variety of different offices. And as uh, Lena mentioned, I do coordinate across um, all the offices within, the, um, within ONC. And so, um, as many of you are quite aware, um, we do have the vision for improving healthcare delivery, um, which is better, smarter, uh, healthier uh, care, and a number of the focus areas around payment form to include um, expanding um, payment models to scale, um, promoting um, integration of coordination of, 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 of clinical services, and bringing a health IT to the point of care for um, individuals. And for those of you who have been um, maybe tracking uh, HHS over the last few months, I just uh, do want to make uh, and point out um, uh, this important announcement from the uh, Secretary uh, in January because it is really uh, historic and um, I think sort of presents the frame for um, the following uh, slides that I'll present on are related to health IT and interoperability. It is the first time in history that there are explicit goals and a timeline for advancing alternative payment models um, for value-based care related to Medicare. So the Secretary announced that by the end of 2016, 30% of Medicare payments will be tied to quality or value through these alternate, alternate payment model. And then by the end of 2018, 50%. <coughs> there will also be linking uh, fee-for-service payments to quality and value. So by 2016, 85% of all Medicare fee-for-service payments will be tied to quality or value and by the end of 2018, 90%. So this is really a game changer for um, uh, many. Um, it does set the mindset differently. So with this shift in payment, providers will be needing to think about how to manage care across the continuum. Um, so it's particularly if they're gonna be accountable for health outcomes and financial outcomes. And home health and other post-acute care providers will need to be partners in this process. So it won't be just simply thinking about the encounter, but thinking about how um, the patient, where they came from, and, and care after um, they uh, receive services um, from your entity. And just to um, provide a little bit of flavor for where we are um, in terms of um, in some of these models, there are currently 424 Medicare ACOs covering 7.8 million Medicare <coughs> beneficiary lives. Uh, many of, the, of these are um, Medicare shared, shared service savings plans, um, as well as Pioneer and other ACOs participating in the CMS innovation models. And the Secretary, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, has new authority uh, uh, for uh, scaling some of these models um, that the actuary has certified as saving trust fund money and improving quality. So some of you may be aware of some of these models of care and um, maybe in fact participating in some of these to include um, bundled payments for close to 50 conditions and procedures, um, models uh, to advance uh, um, primary care, um, uh, other models for uh, addressing dual eligibles, and 34 states are currently participating in state innovation models or what we refer to as SIM. 
And there are certainly other business and policy levers. Um, we think certainly that state governments have an important role to play, and ONC has made a call to action, particularly for states, uh, to use their levers to and their Medicaid purchasing power to help advance interoperability. And these may include things like contracts with managed care organizations. And we also think that private payers and purchasers have a role. So we made a call to action for these partners as well to explore financial incentives and other ways that they can begin advancing interoperability. And another, uh, I think, example that where this has played a role this year, as many of you may be aware, in the 2015 physician fee schedule, there is a new um, reimbursement around chronic care management uh, for um, physicians managing two or more, uh, persons with two or more chronic conditions, and this is tied to certified health IQ. Um, another important, I think, policy lever for this um, sector is um, the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act, or what we refer to as the IMPACT Act. And so this was a bipartisan bill passed in September of 2014 and signed into law in October. And I, again, it, there's requirements around standardized patient assessment data. So in this case, it would be OASIS. And I do want to point out that um, part of this, uh, what's, uh, what the standardized patient assessment data can do is support interoperability. And one of the ways that CMS is doing that is they're working on what they're referring to as a CMS data element library. So what they will be doing is associating health IT standards to those uh, data elements. And so by the end of this year, they anticipate putting out as a public utility this CMS data element library that so that um, providers and vendors can access that um, resource and then they serve as a, 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 the ability for uh, vendors could then reuse that information to serve for other purposes, such as um, transitions of care. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. And so as I mentioned, um, so really what our vision is, is making the data, the right data available to the right people at the right time across products and organizations in a way that can be relied, relied upon and meaningfully used by recipients. And so this is really the underpinning for what we were referring to as a shared nationwide interoperability roadmap. Draft version 1.0, which ONC uh, released publicly in January of 2015. And it serves as the guide for the nation towards meeting the goals of shared information exchange across care settings. Um, this was open for public comment. Um, that public comment period did end April 3rd and we're currently reviewing feedback, but it is a living document which will be updated um, over the course of various years. And so what I do want to point out is some of the, 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 the goals and um, timelines that were identified through that roadmap that articulate the when and how we get to interoperability. So within the, th the three year time frame, what has been identified is uh, the sending, receiving, finding, and using of a common clinical data set across care providers. Within six years, expanding that interoperability, that, that data set uh, to other kinds of uh, health IT end users. So I'm going to talk in future in a couple of slides about um, some work that ONC is doing around social services that I think you'll be interested in. And then in 10 years, um, leveraging interoperability to help inform a learning health system. So reducing the time from evidence to practice. So I've already mentioned that timeline. And there's some other building blocks here. So as I mentioned already, um, part of that is the, the common clinical data set. Also strengthening ONC's certification program um, to um, build out uh, testing tools that could um, help providers and vendors. Uh, educating stakeholders around current federal law to include HIPAA. There's been um, some uh, just misunderstanding, I think, in, in uh, this, uh, out in the public regarding what HIPAA covers and uh, certainly HIPAA does support interoperability. So we think that there's um, some clarification that could help uh, in that arena. Uh, supporting business, clinical, cultural, and regulatory environments. So I've already talked about aligning policy and funding. And then rules of engagement and governance. So establishing a governance framework for interoperability, rules of the road, and a process for recognizing organizations that align to these. So another thing to be aware of, we have another tool that's sort of aligned to this, is a standard ad advisory. Uh, this is an approach that ONC just uh, put forth this year. Uh, to make available a public list of standards and implementation specifications uh, so that uh, it, and to promote dialogue around uh, the best available standards. 
and the reason why this is important is uh, because uh, it, it allows for more flexibility outside of the regulatory process for then um, vendors to adopt and uh, technology and build that into the system um, and, and support uh, interop the interoperability that we will need in the near term. Also important to note is that ONC just recently um, published their um, 2015 edition of uh, certification. So this is a proposed rule with um, broad health IT um, goals um, included. Um, and part of that, again, is the updating of uh, vocabulary and content standards, increased access, so this would be criteria to support transitions of care for individuals, as well as cri criteria to support da uh, data portability. So this would be enabling providers, for example, to export data out of their system or um, to, you know, into a new system or, for example, um, exporting the data to use it by a third-party system for analytics or other purposes. Um, improving market reliability. So there will be new requirements um, uh, in the certification around in-field <coughs> surveillance um, related to the certification program as well as the promotion of an open data file related to ONC has a website that lists all the certified health IT products that have been certified. So uh, going forward, there will be an open data file that will be accessible to the public for uh, product analysis. And certainly support for the continuum of care. So how will this work? Previously in uh, the 2011 and 2014 editions of certification, ONC included policy that was really kind of linked to the EHR incentive programs. For instance, um, definitions for what is uh, certified EHR technology and requirements for meaningful use and measurement. Going forward in this rule and future editions, ONC does not um, plan to include those, uh, that uh, policy uh, within its own rule, but instead of it plans to have each program set its own requirements. Um, and, so, and the intent behind this is so that the certification program can be agnostic to, agnostic to settings and programs, but can support many different use cases. And so as I highlighted there, examples of these could be long-term <coughs> post-acute care and chronic care management. And so if you think about our certification program as sort of an a la carte menu, I've just uh, um, identified a few different criteria that we think would be relevant for this sector. Um, so again, thinking about interoperability is some of the criteria that support that, certainly transitions of care, clinical information reconciliation, and care planning, which is a new criteria um, in this uh, version mm -hmm. of the certification, uh, are some of the areas that we think um, would be certainly <coughs> relevant to this space. Um, and second and third rows really are other um, criteria that either are, uh, are relevant to the first row or um, mandatory for any type of health IT certification. So again, just as an example of how uh, this sector could lever leverage ONC's um, certification program to provide assurance to purchasers. So if you're interested in um, reviewing the rule and providing comment, here are some links. Um, and, oops, let me go to spec. And so, and the comment period does end uh, May 29th. I also do want to just call your attention to some new standards work uh, to support interoperability that uh, you may be interested in. Uh, and this is through what ONC refers to as our SNI framework. SNI the framework uh, kicked off in, in 2010 and is really an open and collaborative community of stakeholders that um, work together, generally online, to address interoperability needs. And there was a recent initiative that was kicked off uh, November 2014 uh, around uh, long-term services and supports. And so and this is in par partnership with uh, uh, CMS. It is driven by the requirements of a grant called uh, the CMS TEFT grant. Again, this focuses on Medicaid community-based long-term uh, services and supports. So think about Medicaid waivers um, and the populations that are served by those waivers. Um, in uh, March of 2014, CMS awarded um, nine states uh, grants for this particular um, uh, effort, and six tough states are participating in this SNI work. Uh, the effort is focused on uh, d identifying standards to support person-centered service planning across uh, with community-based systems, so think about um, long-term services support systems, clinical care systems, and personal health systems that individuals may have. And again, so um, just providing a little more context. Um, Prior to this initiative, a lot of the standards work that ONC was doing is really focused on uh, clinical data. This is really, um, we're pretty excited about this because it is focused on that social service data and filling in the gaps. 
to help you know identify um, information that would be needed to flow as between the community and other uh, key um, partners within the care continuum. So if this is something that you are interested, I'm, I'm certainly happy to talk offline about it, but this is how you would join. Um, the initiative meets every Thursday from 1230 to 1.30. You can follow the link to the wiki, and again, the, the calls are public and online. Finally, I'm going to wrap up with um, a new ONC funding announcement. It's always great to hear about uh, ways you can get money. Uh, so this was announced um, last week at HIMSS. Um, so this uh, funding announcement is called the Community Interoperability and Health Information Exchange uh, uh, Program, and it will uh, provide $1 million in grant funds to, for community projects. Um, and so uh, the funding is for up to 10 community organizations, state or local government agencies, or other community groups. And the idea is uh, to demonstrate the use of health IT, uh, particularly for providers that were not uh, eligible under the Medicare and Medi uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, EHR incentive program. So this could include long-term post-acute care, behavioral health, individuals and caregivers, safety net providers, and others. So I've included here a number of deadlines and key dates. I just want to call it to your attention. The informational webinar will be May 6th, and you can follow the link there for more information. And I just have a, um, I created a resource slide in case you're interested in diving a little deeper. We do have a number of reports and issue briefs available, as well as our um, colleagues at ASPE have um, put out a number of reports that you might find um, helpful as well. One announcement, particularly as we look at that list of resources, because did you manage to copy all those down? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought maybe not. All of the slides are available on the app. Um, I should have said that at the beginning. Um, I was watching you all furiously take notes, and I should have given you the comfort to know that um, you can access the slides, you can pull down all the information, um, and uh, I'm getting nods in the back to assure me that everything is there and that's the easiest way to get the slides uh, so you can follow along and go back through them later. Thanks, Renee. Sure. <laughs> can everybody hear me? Good. All right, so basically I'm a, I'm a telehealth guy. Um, I deal mostly, I, I would say 80% of my practice is telehealth and I deal with all manner of telehealth, health system size, payer side, employer side. So I'm supposed to talk about uh, payer and employer incentives, but I find that before I get into the issue a little bit to provide a little bit of context. So the first few slides are just background for you. And when I was sort of researching for this, I found some of this information very interesting. So healthcare spending. Look at where we've gone in 50 years. And to me, the interesting thing here is the gap between 2012 and what they project in, in uh, 2022 a humongous jump in healthcare spending. Look at it as a percentage of GDP. Almost a fifth of our GDP is related in some way to health. And when we compare it to other countries, you'll see that this is way out of whack compared to what other developed countries' numbers are. Again, look at the jump in the, in the 10 years uh, to the projected 2022. 20, uh, and this is a comparison with developed countries in terms of per capita spending on health care as a share of GDP. And you can see we are way beyond the mark compared to some of these other countries. And when you look at health care factors and indices and outcomes in some of these countries, particularly starting from France all the way to Switzerland, they're better than the U.S. in almost every way. Yet their spending seems to be smarter than what we do here in the United States. I found this a very interesting chart only because it shows you how the spending is distributed. And, and the thing that you need to pay attention to is hospital care accounting for 32%. That's the number everybody wants to drive down. Expensive, inefficient, that's the number everybody wants, wants to drive down. Now, if you look at home care, which by the way includes hospice care, only 3% of spending. So I just wanted, I found this chart incredibly interesting in, in terms of how much of our care is actually provided in hospitals and how inefficient that is. By the way, all these slides are from the California Healthcare Foundation that does a tremendous job of researching this, this kind of material. And then by sponsor, and so you can see a lot of us receive our insurance um, from private business through our employer, and that's why we're going to talk about employer incentives in, in a second. This chart is from 2009. A colleague of mine always uses this, and I never knew this. Look at the first two lines. 
five percent of the population accounts for almost half of health care spending in the United States. That is an incredible, incredible number. The second number to me is almost just as bad. Twenty percent of the population accounts for four-fifths of our health care spending. So a small segment of our population is driving the spending in this country. And how do we get to those people and how do we provide care to those people to drive some of these numbers down? So with that context in mind, I'm going to talk about what I came here to talk about, which is payer and employer incentives. So here, here are sort of the five factors I see as driving some of this. So we're in a transition. We're in a weird phase. We are going from a fee-for-service environment where providers provide a service, payers pay, to what one of my colleagues calls income for outcome. So you're only going to get paid if you have the right quality measures in place and if patient outcomes meet a certain level. Um, and to get there, we are testing all kinds of interesting models. We've talked about ACOs, medical homes, readmissions initiatives. Um, we're testing that to see whether or not we can actually come to a system that is a, an efficient income for outcome. We don't know that yet, but this is an interesting transition over the next half decade. Then there's the patient. Consumers are demanding in-home treatment. People don't want to get in their cars and drive. It's inconvenient. A lot of people don't want to take time off work. They would rather have care provided in the home so long as it's quality care. Telehealth is increasingly being viewed as an efficient and cost-effective delivery model. Now, the thing about telehealth you have to remember, the data that's available is not where it needs to be, and that is what is driving some of the issues that Lena talked about in terms of Congress and some of the controversies. I think there's a perception that there's not enough data out there to support telehealth as an effective um, care delivery model. And then available technology. Some of the other speakers are going to talk about technology that's available today. I go to the American Telemedicine Association exhibit hall, and you walk up and down those halls, you see some of the most incredible health technology you'll ever see. None of it is ever going to be in a hospital or any kind of system you can think about, simply because the technology is so far ahead of where we are clinically and in terms of laws and regulations. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But the technology is certainly there. Employers are under different kinds of pressures. Now, some of you may have heard of the Cadillac tax. It's a tax that's going to be imposed starting in 2018 on employers. It's a 40% excise tax that if um, certain thresholds are exceeded, I think it's $10,000 for individuals, a little over $27,000 for, for a group. If those th premium thresholds are exceeded, a tax is imposed on employers and payers. So guess what? Premiums are tied to health care costs, so employers are incentivized to try to drive down health care costs of, of their employees, plans of their enrollees. How do you do that? You cannot continue to do the same thing you're doing now. Uh, what they're also finding out is that a lot of employees refuse to take time off work to go see any kind of provider, whether it's a physician, PA, um, whatever have you. Why? The AMA estimated that for a doctor's appointment, for the average physician's appointment, an employee has to take four hours off to go see the provider. So you can see why that happens. The more visits you forego, the worse your health problem may be. It may be exacerbated and may actually end up being more expensive than if you had taken the time off work. Now, you've heard a lot of employers, especially your large employers with centralized workforces, have implemented on-site clinics. Some of them work, some of them don't, and what employers are finding out is they're much more expensive to operate than originally imagined. So guess what? A lot of employers now are looking at telemedicine as a possible vehicle um, for their employees. There's so many issues, legal and regulatory issues we can get into with telemedicine that employers don't understand, but they're going to understand pretty soon. Um, I, a couple of us wrote an article about telemedicine and employers and legal issues, and I cannot believe the response we got from that, simply because employers don't quite understand all the legal and regulatory issues from licensure, scope of practice, credentialing, privacy. We could go on and on and on and on. The other thing, we talked a little bit about this, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that so many consumers seem ready for something else. And here's a few studies that have been done. 
uh, you know, three-fourths of consumers say they would use telehealth for a lot of conditions, and that number is expected to grow. And if you think about the 30 and under crowd who uses smartphone technology and other technology to communicate, you know this number is going to increase dramatically. Cisco did a similar study, and then you can see the, the study in the journal. Uh, similar numbers, as you can see, pretty consistent across the board. And here's some evidence of the telehealth market. I usually put this up to show folks what is really happening in the market. As you can see, there is going to be tremendous increase, not just in the United States, but globally. In fact, I would say that if you look outside the United States, you're probably going to find some of your more interesting telehealth initiatives occurring by necessity. It's the same reason why in sub-Saharan Africa your smartphones are phenomenal, by necessity. Their landlines are terrible. They have no other means of communication. So this is what's going on in the market, and as you can see, the market is really, really going to explode in the next 10 years. And I see it already with all the interesting models um, that are out there. Now, this is uh, Towers Watson is a consulting research firm that does a lot of work in uh, employer health benefits and cost management kinds of uh, issues. And here's what they've talked about. Here's their conclusion about what would happen if employers actually use telehealth services um, in a meaningful way. Um, now, currently only a fifth of employers offer telehealth services for their employees. Now, this is employers of a thousand employees or larger. Um, you can see a lot of the other numbers there, but the other number you need to uh, be concerned about is that 34 percent more considering doing it over the next three years and the reason the three years is important is back to the Cadillac tax. Employers, large employers, self-funded plans are incentivized to control the health care costs of their clients. Everything they've done so far hasn't worked. Telehealth is the next frontier. Here are some of the drivers that we need to be thinking about, and I probably should have included this in my context slides. But look at our population by 2030. Look at the share of our population in 2030 that's going to be 65 or over. That's a fifth of our population. You couple that with the fact that we have fewer physicians. Um, there's already a shortfall now um, by 63,000. There's going to be a shortfall that's going to increase in 10 years. Now, the interesting thing here is a lot of the shortfall is with your PCP population, your primary care physician population, and some of your specialties as well. So you've got an increasing population an increasing share of aging population, fewer physicians. That doesn't sound like a good thing to me. And here are some of the things we've talked about before, the income for outcome, um, driven, driven by increased patient costs. What are the strategies we're using to control those costs? Now, one thing I should have mentioned is that there's a lot of attention being paid by hospitals themselves on reducing readmissions. And one of the things they have been using is remote patient monitoring programs, incredibly sophisticated uh, RPM programs to control readmissions and, and control costs. And one of the things they're doing is partnering with home health agencies and SNFs um, to control the patient population, usually using RPM programs. And then again, we talked about the ubiquity of technology. So. When we have our town hall meeting, I'd like to get into a discussion of all this sounds great. Um, obviously, there's an incentive for payers and employers to reduce their health care costs. Telehealth is seen as an opportunity to do so. But I'm going to talk about why that is only the beginning of the question. Because ultimately, there are so many legal, regulatory, and policy barriers that we have to wrestle with if we want to make this a reality. So now we'll switch. How else did I go? Now I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, let me. We have two microphones. Um, yeah, I think that'll make sense. I'll 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 field from here. We'll have the mic here. Um, oh, we need to do the questions into the mic too, don't we? Okay, hang on. <laughs> yeah, we'll 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 readjust. Watch. Watch how flexible we can be. Here, there you go. take this one. I'll take this one. Good. We're excellent. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, may I, so, okay. 
thank you for bearing with that. We we have a system now. Um, we are going to open this up for questions, and we have some time to dig into the policy, um, both from the federal perspective and more broadly. If you have questions, please be sure to introduce yourself, where you're from, and a little bit about um, your either background in health IT or your interest in being here, so we can make sure. Um, we begin to understand a little bit more what's happening on the ground uh, for you all as well. But I'd actually like to start, at, I'm going to take the, my prerogative here to start with a question. Um, Liz, Renee, what, what are your, given this complex regulatory environment, given everything that's going on, what are some suggestions for getting started? You know, what are some suggestions in getting started in adopting health IT and engaging in health information exchange? What do you, how do you, thoughts? So, so I just want, I'm curious to know, I'll ask a question to the folks in here in the room. How many folks have an EHR? Is that EHR interoperable? Are you able to use that EHR to connect with your, your referral partners, the, the people? Ah, there you go. So a few of you. Yeah, over here. And so is it meaning, and so I just, yeah, go ahead. very good. So I mean, I guess what I'm t the, one of the things to think about is, you know, think, sort of get together a plan and think about what are some of the quality improvement initiatives and work that you're wanting to achieve. And think about how your health IT can support that. Um, have you all been working together with your referral partners in the community to ask them, you know, questions such as what are the kinds of information that you want to receive and the kinds of information that you in turn want to receive, again, to help support some of those quality improvement uh, I initiatives and work. Is there, are there, is there, anybody want to talk a little bit about some of that? Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Richard Robertson. I'm from Kansas City. Uh, we have quite a, uh, an extensive um, telemedicine system with Honeywell and some other things going on. But in answer to the question of interoperability, I think that you'll find <coughs> that most VNAs are independent of hospital systems. Mm -hmm. Some are not. Uh, some are linked in. But I think that um, becomes problematic when you have to work with a hospital system to get referrals right. and the information that go with those referrals if you're outside the loop. Many of the hospitals in our market in Kansas City have their own home health agencies and thus are uh, a lot better prepared to transmit that information to their own home health agency, which gives them a leg up over mm -hmm. the other independent freestanding home health agencies. So I think um, <clears throat> Information exchanges in our market, we, Kansas City is right on the state line between Missouri and Kansas, mm -hmm. for those of you who are geographically challenged. <laughs> um, and uh, so Missouri has an information exchange, Kansas has an information exchange, and in the metropolitan area there's, a, there's an information exchange. None of those three information exchanges talk with each other. Mm -hmm. And yep, part of the problem with that is, is that they, uh, we, we belong to one information exchange, which is a flat rate payment for all uploads and downloads. Mm -hmm. The other two uh, let you join free for uploads but charge you for downloads. And so I think that part of the, the problem that we face as the United States, and this being an organization that has members in many, many different states, uh, is that the information exchanges are so um, difficult to maneuver and difficult to understand how that all works. So uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for you all to to get up there and comment about something that would be germane to everyone here. Right. It's difficult for us to give you our questions in Kansas City that might not be a question in Boston. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult uh, thing to maneuver. And I think that part of uh, most VNAs are, are freestanding. As I say, some are not. Mm -hmm. But um, that gives us this kind of um, um, handicap to talk with some of the hospitals within our geographic areas. And to be able to be to St. Mary's up here and to Menorah over here is different if they're on two different systems. Right. I th Go ahead. So I was just going to say, I think, I mean, a part of what I was going to uh, just try to hit on is that I just I think it's really important to think about, you know, having these 
uh, conversations with your hospital partners about what it, what quality, what value you're bringing in, how that help, think about how the health IT can help support that. And so it looks very different to your point in different markets. Right, but, but again, if we want to be uh, friends with this hospital over right. here, um, then we've got to get in their system. Yep. This hospital over here, we're SOL, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. Go ahead. From Christian Care, I'm Delaware. I think it's um, you can exchange information, but it doesn't mean unless it's in the medical record that the next person receiving is going to use it. We had a very interesting retreat at our agency. Um, we're part of a health system. Um, our system has a referral management system in which um, clinical information is going out to the providers, but. The d physicians, unless they see you as a provider in the record, it, d it doesn't matter if information's going out. They want to look at your visit notes. They want to see that information. We're not there yet, but um, they don't even know half the time that a post-acute provider is actually providing care and um, wants to see the content but not get it in a separate document that they have to click in another place. They won't use it. At least that's what feedback we've gotten. So. So one of the challenges we're going to have here is thinking about the workflow and how, what are the innovations that, that you can scale up in workflow to really make that successful. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. But I also want to acknowledge that so many of these questions and problems we'll be talking about are so different from state to state and from agency to agency. But given the nods across the room, the experience is, not, is the same. Um, the the problems and the solutions may be different, but I think you'll you'll feel that across the room, and we'll try to figure out what those are and lift them up. Um, Renee, are there any legal or regulatory barriers on telehealth? How do you see that unfolding, particularly as it relates to home care? <coughs> Where do we begin? Um, <laughs> So if, off the top of my head, in terms of legal issues with regards to telehealth, licensure is the first, is the first barrier. How many of you know that licensure follows where the patient is located, not where the provider is located? A lot of people don't even don't understand that. Then there's scope of practice issues, what you can and cannot do. There are privacy and security issues. Um, do you, let's say you videotape all your telehealth encounters. Do you include that as part of the medical record or not? There are all kinds of decisions that need to be made. Credentialing and privileging is another one. We see a lot of arrangements that implicate fraud and abuse, both federal fraud and abuse laws and state fraud and abuse laws. So that's just off the top of my head. I think perhaps the biggest barrier is reimbursement. Um, who pays for it and, and how do they pay for it? Um, I will tell you that Medicare, the last figures I saw under the Medicare telehealth benefit, $12 million was reimbursed in 2013 under the Medicare telehealth benefit. Over $580 billion was reimbursed by the entire program. So it tells you the Medicare telehealth benefit is a mere drop in the bucket. There's so many restrictions um, regarding uh, geography, regarding where the patient has to present, regarding what kind of provider can provide um, the services in order to be reimbursed under telehealth. And there's no reimbursement for telehealth in the home. Medicaid programs, as you, many of you know, they're state programs, so they vary. Many of them are not better than the Medicare um, coverage requirements. So there are so many. Um, and in terms of home care, in terms of post-acute, I think in some ways, um, there's progress there because hospitals now have these readmissions penalties under Medicare, and so they are really partnering in a better way, at least the hospitals we represent are partnering in a better way with their home health agencies and other post-acute care providers, and they're also paying attention to um, acti activities of daily living. They're paying attention to daily vitals monitoring, so we see a lot of uptick in RPM programs driven by hospitals. Any other questions? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is. What is that thing? Good afternoon. My name is Michael Socio, and I'm from uh, Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut. The question f is really for Renee. When you presented the data on telehealth, it feels somewhat as if we we keep using that term telehealth, and it's changing. Um, but the statistics that you showed with the the growth and the boom. Um, was it really more 
related to, I think, what people in this room consider traditional telehealth, or is it really more telehealth um, similar to the American Well model where you're actually consulting with physicians, patients, employees, and such, having um, you know dialogue with a physician as opposed to getting on a scale and checking your blood pressure? That's a great question. And usually when I do uh, my longer talks on telehealth, the first thing I start off with is definitional. What do we mean by telehealth? What do we mean by telemedicine? How is it defined? I know, for example, the federal government uses telehealth and telemedicine, I think, 50-something times, and it's defined differently each time. So that tells you where, uh, where we're headed as a market. But to answer your question, those statistics include three different kinds of what we call telehealth, or at least for purposes of these stats. Live interactive um, consultations of the type he's talking about with American Well, where a patient gets on some kind of um, hopefully secure platform and through an audiovisual connection is actually communicating with a physician or some other kind of provider. It also includes store and forward, what we call store and forward, which is where you have an image. Usually it's an image which you send to a provider. The provider can look at it at a later point and then do a diagnosis or treatment or whatever they have to do. And it also includes remote patient monitoring. So it's the broad specter. It's everything included. Other questions? Totally. Oh, oh here. I'm Pat West. I'm from um, the Eastern Sierra in California. And um, Liz, I would focus this toward you, where you've introduced us to ONC, mm -hmm. which seems to have federal money focused on using these wonderful um, systems, products, operations. And yet, at the same time, another branch of the same government is the payer source and doesn't pay for any of these wonderful things. So do you guys talk to each other? And is there any collaboration going on towards payment for all of this study that you're, that's going on? Well, I think, I think we certainly see telehealth as this one of the solutions, particularly, as was mentioned prior, um, to supporting some of these payment reform models. And I think as well, um, so we're looking at how, certainly how it fits in. Um, and I know through our funding opportunity announcements, so these are, again, grants, these are demonstrations. And so I think through our work, we're able to, you know, build out some of the evidence that was noted as being needed. I think those are, again, some of the low-hanging fruit for us. Um, uh, so we certainly do talk to our CMS colleagues, and I think we're certainly seeing sort of a, the, a, a movement towards, you know, a further adoption of, of meaningfully, of, um, of telehealth services, but I think it's, you know, it's progressing, and we need to, there's a lot of um, more that work that needs to be done in this space, um, particularly around getting some agreement. One, in one area is like the federal definition, there's, we, we have a number of, um, different federal entities within the federal government that are, are working on telehealth. Um, so these are certainly areas that we're, it's, it's evolving. The one thing I would add is that un until Medicare expands coverage for telehealth and reimbursement for telehealth, I'm not sure how these federal models are going to be successful vis-a-vis -vis telehealth. We, you know, you have great, wonderful language in, uh, I remember the, the ACO regs, you've got wonderful language all over the place spouted by the federal government, but you've got to put your money where your mouth is. And to me, meaningful payment for telehealth services, I think, would um, accelerate uh, telehealth adoption in a way that I don't think is possible now, given the uh, restrictions on reimbursement. And a follow-up to that probably to you, Renee, because I'm not sure, Liz, you can speak to this. But what's it going to take to get Medicare to do that? Um, the big problem, and not to get too inside Washington, but is the scoring of, of any sort of uh, spending bill. So, you know, scoring. Yeah, score <laughs> scoring is a way for, uh, it's, a, it's a budgetary way for, um, for measuring impact on the federal budget of certain kinds of programs. I guess that's the best way to say it. Yeah. 
So, so there, obviously, if you reduce the geographic restriction, utilization of telehealth is going to go up. So the question is, are there other ways we can score these kinds of bills without implicating all kinds of, 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 of political issues? I don't think we're there yet. Um, so we have to be a little bit more creative. And I think one of the problems is there's not enough data to convince a lot of legislators that in the long run, this is actually going to be a money saver. All they see increased utilization. They're not yet convinced, in my view. Yeah. It's Rich Robertson again. Renee, this is kind of for you. <clears throat> we, um, we've got even a broader definition of telehealth that would involve robocall machines for medication reminders. Um, some, um, we, we have some student PharmDs that get on the phone and talk to patients in their home about their medication regimens. Um, again, it's a broader definition of, of telemedicine, some um, interactive voice response uh, that involves the patient calling in and going through a telephone tree type of response system. Um, some of our patients call in and um, over the phone read us their blood pressure and weight and we put it into the system to monitor it. Obviously, the, we have Honeywell Home Ed that does that more automatically. Um, we have teaching devices that our nurses take into the home that are uh, pad oriented uh, so they can show the patient about uh, what is uh, diabetic neuropathy and, and go through that and see a video from Crames on it. So that's our, our, our definition of telehealth is, is so broad it, it, it encompasses a lot of things that we know never will be paid for but involve better outcomes and thus make us more marketable in the process and better than the competition. So I would love to have payment for you know, the Honeywell Home Ed device, but I know that that's a, a, a long way away. But I, I'm pretty sure we'll never get payment for the robocall machine that reminds a patient to take their medications. But that could be very, very effective. No, and you bring up some interesting points. So one thing we've ignored here is private payers. And I will say in many ways, private payers are ahead of the curve. In many ways, they've been forced to be ahead of the curve. So there are 21 states in the District of Columbia that have what they call telehealth parity statutes. And these statutes basically uh, call for private payers to reimburse for telehealth services if those same services would have been reimbursed had they been provided in person. So about 40% uh, of the states really force private payers to pay for telehealth services. But to the gentleman's point, telehealth is narrowly defined. And usually if you look at these state statutes, they only provide reimbursement for live, interactive, audiovisual consultations. So anything done over the phone usually is not part of the definition of telehealth. The, some of the technology he's talking about, usually not paid for because it's not part of the definition of telehealth. So you bring up an interesting point, which is a definitional point. What is telehealth and what are payers going to be comfortable paying for? I think that if we're going to take this incrementally, I think the first barrier is getting folks, both public and private payers, to at least pay for the live audiovisual interactive consultation between patient and provider. Okay, you have a question here? Uh, extremely welcome. Naive question. I believe Liz said that the Senate is is on board to. I can I can speak more to Lena. Senate stuff than Liz. Oh, can. that's right. a federal okay. employee. I'm, I'm just going to give her that's plausible right. deniability. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. I'm Anne Marie McChrystal from VNA of the Treasure Coast, but I am a board member, just so everybody understands. But, and of course, our telehealth is paid through funding, uh, fund development. So you said the Senate was just about to open up and they were, they were you know, open up their, their minds to reimbursement for telehealth. But the House isn't. So what drives, Renee, does CMS drive the government? Does the government drive CMS? That's my question. I'm going to let Renee tackle that, but I, I, I'm going <laughs> to. I I do want to put a plug in though for part of the reason I as you know as a as a partner of VNAAs, I'm so excited to have this session. Part of what drives this is demand, 
a big part of what's driving technology and innovation and what's driving Congress and the administration right now is demand from providers and consumers that technology and telehealth plays a real role in the ability of patients to stay at home, to get coordinated care, and for all members of the care team to really have uh, appropriate data and workflow available to better manage their care. And if you assume, as I do, that Congress listens to its constituents, you know, they are driven, at least in part, by what they're hearing from their home health agencies as they consider this, as they're hearing from home. And, you know, I, 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 I do, I'll, I'll let Renee, who's hopefully had time to come up with a better answer than mine, um, but want to put a plug in for the fact that there is a role to play of all of us in demanding this and demanding the efficiencies and demanding the reimbursement because it is, it is critical. Chris, do you actually want to jump in here as well? Have your agencies invited or taken your own senators or representatives on home visits? I would highly recommend that 100% of the hands in this room be raised next time because it, it is exactly as I, I was just in Washington uh, meeting with with um, both House and Senate from from different states and they don't get what we do um, and so and and for those that already have um, we know uh, Kansas City you have a, a, a telehealth program how many have an active telehealth program or had one that they're trying to figure out how to revitalize I would recommend you also when you do those home visits take them to a home that has a patient who has a wonderful story. Everybody who has a telehealth program has one Mabel or, or Steve that, that has this wonderful story. Take them into that home because they don't get it. They hear, they hear the vendors talk about it. They hear other people pushing it. But until they're in that home and they have this, this individual who's been able to stay in the house instead of being in the ICU over and over again 16 times in three months, that's what, that's what they need. So if you, if you haven't done it yet, do it uh, as soon as you can. <laughs> yeah, that is a good one. That's a really good one. But so let me reframe this question then to Renee and then to Liz. Um, you know, Renee, given that your role is working with policymakers to change their mind and to bring these forces to bear and to really, you know, advocate for telehealth, to what do they respond? You know, what is driving the interest? You know, what, what can be done? The, the, the two words I always hear are evidence-based. So I think there's a perception. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but there's a perception that there's not enough data um, out there to really make a convincing case. Now, I would, I would say, look, the VA has done a phenomenal job, and they've got phenomenal data. But one of the things that the, the counterargument to that, it's a closed system. Of course, you're going to have great data. It's a, it's a closed system. It's easy to capture a lot of the data. They don't have a lot of the same barriers that folks outside the VA have. Um, there's also not a lot of look at non-US peer-reviewed studies. There's a lot out there. I, I can think of one in the UK that showed phenomenal um, outcomes from the use of telehealth. So I think in addition to what the gentleman from Cardiocom said, which I agree with 100%, a lot of these folks have no idea what a lot of you are doing. I think data, to the degree that you can provide data on a consistent basis that makes the case, the better. Yeah, no, and I, and I, I think uh, my, own, my CMS colleagues, I'll put a pitch for them, and they're not at the table right now, are very interested to hear your perspectives as well. Um, and to, to hear about how, you know, reimbursement around, home, um, around uh, telehealth and what you're seeing and the efficiencies, you know, and any evidence that you're willing to share. Um, I'm sure I know that they'd be very interested to have those conversations. Have you had those conversations already with some of your CMS colleagues? Okay, um, I'm with these two ladies with the VNA of the Treasure Coast in Vero Beach, Florida. Um, why does, if we're going to bring um, evidence based and outcome data? to the decision makers in Washington, why doesn't Honeywell, Cardiocom, survey all of their clients and bring all this data 
together for us. I mean, if you've got good outcomes and good data, rather than me sharing it with one acute care hospital, which I do on a quarterly basis to show them outcome data for telehealth versus non-telehealth, why isn't the manufacturers coming together and soliciting their clients to, to collaborate this data and then bring it forth? Rather than, you know, one VNA in Vero Beach and one VNA in Kansas City, I mean, there's strength in numbers. Wh why aren't the manufacturers that we're partner with helping us provide that data on a, on a broader basis? I'll give it a shot. So I'm Liz Madigan. I live in the Ivory Tower. So I, you know, I'm Liz Madigan from Case Western I'm your, Reserve. I'm your roommate then. Yeah, I exactly. Guess. So no, I, I live. In, I'm in an academic setting, and so what the what they're looking for, what the policymakers are looking for, is not things that come from the industry because it's seen as self-serving. And I mean, just to be because the the concern is is that that would be brought to them to convince them to pay for something so that these companies could make more money. That's that's not a bad thing, but it's seen as self-serving. What we need is evidence done by researchers who don't have any kind of benefit to be gained from any any of the decisions that are made. So the evidence that exists, unfortunately, is very mixed on telehealth in terms of remote patient monitoring. So it doesn't necessarily reduce rehospitalizations when it's done in a rigorous way. And so our challenge is is that it does have benefits in other things. So it does it does reduce the length of the hospitalization, but it doesn't necessarily reduce the number of hospitalizations. Right? So it, it improves patient quality of life but it doesn't necessarily reduce emergency department use always. And so there's a lot of mixed results in the evidence here. And so that's part of the challenge Renee's talking about. And, and the, the folks in Washington, the staffers who are helping their legislators make these decisions, that's the body they look at. That's the information they look at. So there's a lot of good evidence from home care agencies who've done this. And that's why I think Chris's point about taking your legislator out, right? Because they're trying to balance both what the science says as well as what they actually see. And what's more compelling to them is what happens with their with the people that they represent. So those stories are very powerful and I can't emphasize enough that you can counter some of the things that exist in the scientific evidence that's sort of mixed up. I mean, Dr. Bob's back in the back. He can, he can tell you the same thing I have. We've looked at this stuff. It's really very sort of, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's not overwhelming and persuasive, but those individual stories are. I would just say that your, your those three companies you mentioned, um, I've worked with all of them over the last 13 years, and they have lobbyists, and they are trying to help advocate. Um, any of you that can can do white papers or case studies individually um, to help, again, from an industry standpoint, um, it it helps. And and get with your vendor um, that you're using if you're wondering, you know, how do we go about that? How you know, most of the vendors um, would love to work with you on putting together a white paper or a case study. Um, so if you haven't done one yet, um, again, reach out to your vendors and say, hey, look, we've had this program for a while. We want to do a we want to do a case study. And whether it's looking at reduction of readmission, reduction of length of stay for hospitals, they love that. Um, whether it's increased um, patient satisfaction scores, any of the things that, again, the whole care continuum is looking at as important to reduction of cost um, would be nice to do. So if, if you haven't done one yet, get with your vendors and say, hey, look, as my, as my vendor, help me put this together. So any, um, I, any last questions on the policy and regulatory environment? We do have the opportunity at the end to talk with all of our panelists again, but um, any last specific questions for Renee or Liz before we move on? I think then I'm going to move us on to the next panel since we're bleeding in that direction anyway. Let me formally introduce um, the rest of our speakers um, and we'll continue to, to move in that direction. And again, rem remembering we'll have plenty of time at the end to think both tactically about the ways you can be involved, um, but also more broadly what's going on. So with that, let me formally introduce Liz Madigan. Uh, who will speak next. She is the independent, the Independence Foundation Professor of Nursing and the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. She has been a nurse since 1979 and a home health, home health care nurse, agency administrator, and researcher since 1981. She has had multiple studies funded by, the, by federal f and foundations in examining patient outcomes in home health care, and her perspective on data research and what's happening in the home and in health industry is just going to provide so much depth to this conversation today. Um, moving down the line, Alan Bugos is the Head of Technology and Innovation 
for Philips Home Monitoring, Philips Lifeline. He is responsible for designing and implementing technology for next generation devices, products, ma <coughs> excuse me, managed solutions for connecting, <coughs> for connected alerting, monitoring, and health informatics within the home for Philips global customer base. And he brings more than 25 years of hands-on engineering and, and IT leadership experience in telecommunications, mobile and internet technologies, and data solutions. And then Chris Taylor from Cardiocom on the end has worked, as he said, with home health and hospice agencies as well as hospitals to, st <coughs> maybe I have to introduce themselves here, to strategically integrate innovative technologies. And his experience includes industry leading health, uh, in health technology organizations, and he works with current and future technologies to advance financial, operational, and clinical benefits to healthcare providers. So as you can see from the bios, we are moving from policy much more into, <coughs> into implementation and to the cutting edge of what is this field. We'll let all three of them do their presentations, and then we will open it up again to questions uh, for these three more specifically on what the future of technology um, and the real cutting edge of technology is for home health and home health care providers. Liz? All right, so I sort of already introduced myself. Um, I am an old home care nurse, as you heard in my bio, so I have to tell you, I've started out by saying I'm equally terrified and excited about all the technology that's coming. Um, I'm excited because I think it has great potential. I'm terrified because I don't know how we're going to do it. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So this is the, uh, I'm going to talk about sort of three things today. Um, sort of the new technologies, what's on the horizon, sort of both short term and then sort of in the sort of longer term, but not as long term as you may think. Um, what we know about older people and engagement with technology. And then some results. I'm going to talk about a fitness band study because this is one where I think we have some potential, but we also have to be cautious about what we're doing here. <coughs> so. There's a lot of new stuff coming out. You know, we've had glucometers for a long time, right? We've had INR point of care devices for a long time. This stuff is moving fast. It's not going to be very long that we're going to be able to use one drop of blood and do a metabolic panel. Okay? So patients will be able to, I think about dialysis patients. I want to know what those beans and creats are, right? We'll be able to do it with one drop of blood. This is very cool. It's getting better. These are going to be, these are not going to require blood. It's going to be a little thing you put on your skin, and it'll be wireless. That'll give you frequent and continuous data. You won't have to do any kind of sticks. You won't have to make it. It'll be on your skin. This is not as far away as you may think. These are, these are being tested right now for blood glucose testing. So as soon as they start being tested, you know the technology is going to move really quick. So I'm really excited about this. I think in terms of patient self-management and all those kinds of things that we want patients to do, that we want to know as clinicians, how helpful will that be? Here's what I'm worried about. What are we going to do with all this data, right? There's going to be so much information. And what about the workflow? So, you know, I, I mean, I have a relative, I won't name names, who does his blood glucose three times a day, even though he's been stable for a long time. I can just imagine these kind of, the, you know, these folks calling the office saying, my INR is 2.6, it was 2.5 this morning. Do I need to be concerned? <laughs> right? I mean, we all know these patients, right? So, exactly. So, the workflow is what scares me. Which provider? How is the data going to be managed? Now, there are analytics coming that I think are going to be very helpful, but I think that we, all, we also have to work that out. So the analytics, data analytics is, is a smart system, a clinical decision support system, for example, that will say, your patient's INR over the past three days has gone up by so long. In the past, this meant this, but we're going to have to figure out how to incorporate this into what we actually do. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that, I mean, this is why I'm excited and terrified, because I'm not sure how we're going to do this. Home visits. So we talked a little bit about this. I'm going to use the terms remote patient monitoring to be sort of the, what we're talking about in terms of that piece, as well as the telehealth piece that Renee was talking about. So Renee actually did my part for me here. Thank you, Renee. <laughs> what we don't know, and this is the evidence piece, is who really benefits from the remote patient monitoring. So how do most agencies do this? Do you got monitors on the shelf? You send out an email to the nurses. We got too many monitors on the shelf. Take them out and provide them. How many agencies do that? I'm not. So there's. I mean, this is. This is what happens. You've invested a lot of money in this capital equipment. You want it used. Do we know what works best for? The evidence doesn't really tell us, right? We, we sort of, we see what we, I mean, we have observations. We sort of know, we think, who works best for. But do we know? So here's, here's my story. What happens with this stuff? You put the people in and the technology in. You provide care. You take the people out and the technology out at the same time. Why don't we leave the technology in? See how it goes. I know the answer to this. I used to run an agency. It's because the patient's no longer under services, so then you have a legal obligation. 
right? Why can't we test some of these models where we do transitional home care? Not transitions after the hospital, but transitional home care. What do these patients need? Maybe, maybe the stuff you're doing in Kansas City with the telephone calls is sufficient. So the mortality curve, do you know the mortality curve? This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to go like this. You go along your life, you're living very happily, all of a sudden you get sick and die, right? It's not this downhill decline that nobody wants to talk about or think about, right? It's the mortality curve. The only way we can do that is if we back things up in the disease course. So this is where the old days of home health care with having disease prevention and health promotion, there's, there's legs here, guys. And if you're not looking at these kinds of things in terms of working with other kinds of providers and providing health promotion to disease prevention, you're missing an opportunity. And it's going to get bigger and bigger if we're trying to push stuff back in the course of the disease. So this is where I think we actually have opportunities with telehealth and with remote patient monitoring to actually sort of think about these kinds of things. So uh, Alan's going to talk about the smart home. I want to give you a couple examples, and these are in the slides that you'll have access to. There's a lot of smart home stuff being tested right now. What are these smart home things? What kinds of things? So some of this is technology that you know, they have along the wires, along the wall. So if somebody falls, it senses it and, lets, and alerts somebody. There's all kinds of very cool things coming out here. Um, and so I'll, I won't take, Alan's, I won't take any Alan's stuff on this, but I do want to talk about the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is sensors that are connected. Does anybody have a Nest thermostat? Right? The Nest thermostat connects to the Internet. I think this is a missed opportunity. If it, connects to the, if it connects to the Internet, it could also give me an alert if I was somebody with COPD to say, today's a air quality alert day. You shouldn't be going out. Or you should be going out in the morning or the evening, not in the middle of the day. Right? It, it's connected to the Internet. It has the access to get all kinds of information we need to know. So the, the, these Nest thermostats are getting smarter and smarter. Mercedes-Benz actually has one now where it will sense when you're within a certain distance from home and turn your thermostat up to your desired temperature. Is that a little creepy? What I don't want is my refrigerator saying, you ate all the ice cream last night. I don't need that reminder. <laughs> but I think that we're only seeing just the beginning of the Internet of Things and the possibilities here. Because there's lots of opportunities here that I think we haven't really even thought about in terms of how all this stuff interconnects and what it can do to help us help patients do better. So one of the things that always comes up is people don't want this. Well, I think there's a broad range of what people want and don't want and what they're willing to balance. And so I'm going to talk in a couple minutes about sort of the use of technology by older people. But we've done a little work with um, focus groups in continuing care retirement communities to sort of say, and this was based on robo robots, really, believe it or not, um, what kinds of things would you find helpful? And what kinds of things would you find intrusive? Because what, you know, one of the things that older people say is, I don't want my daughter knowing what I'm doing all the time. I think that's absolutely all right. They need to be able to determine who, who has access to their information. But what the interesting thing to me was, when we were talking with these older folks, their concerns about privacy and intrusiveness were totally outbalanced by the fact that if it gave them an opportunity to have some information shared with somebody that would help keep them safe, they were all about that. They were not at all concerned about the intrusiveness. So we said, if the robot could figure out that you were laying on the floor, would it be okay if they contacted somebody? And they said, sure, absolutely. They weren't at all concerned about the intrusiveness otherwise. So I think that we have a lot to learn. The problem here is there's a lot of small numbers and there aren't many studies done yet. So a lot of these big surveys that have been done really talk sort of just like they give you one question at a time. It's the kind you get on the phone. You know what I'm talking about, right? So what we haven't done is really sort of dig into some of this kind of stuff and really look at these balances between intrusiveness and privacy and security and all these things that are important, but at what risk, right? Or what are they willing to give up to get that kind of, you know, because people say, as I got older, and as I got frailer, I was okay with more help. I was okay with people knowing more because I was worried that I would fall and nobody would find me. So they were willing to sort of balance those things out in a very different way. We don't have the definitive answers to these things yet. So smart sensors, um, so there's all these apps, right? Did you realize there's about 400 health-related apps that come out every month? Every month, new health-related apps? Not regulated. Uh, my favorite is the one where it says, use the light on your cell phone to treat your seasonal affective disorder. <laughs> They're not regulated. So some of this can be snake oil. That's why I put snake oil on there. There's just Some are legitimate and very helpful. Others are totally bogus. And because, it, because it's, it's, a wi it's the Wild West out there with those apps. So when people talk to you about apps and you know, I got this new app, you got to go, okay, let's look and see what we got. Some of them are very good. They're very helpful. And others are just, you just don't know what you're getting. So here's the other thing that's coming. So it, what we're going to have is best, they're really testing vests and clothing now that have sensors in them. 
So, you know, if you have AFib or something like that, it'll pick up, your shirt will pick up whether you have AFib or not, T-shirt, send a remote, you're, you're having a period of AFib, atrial fibrillation. Once your provider notified, that's very cool, isn't it? Now there's implantables, and so some of these are small implantables, and some are big implantables, and this is, again, where I get into the creepy factor. It feels like science fiction, right? But this is a lot closer than you may think, actually, some of these things are already being tested. What we don't know is, where, are people going to use them? Will the data be useful? What are we going to do with all this information? What about the worried well? This is the folks, these are the people who are going to the ones, like my relative I'm not naming, who routinely like sort of monitor these things very closely. So the, I think the thing is, is there's some misconception about older people and technology. And one of the things is that people over 65 don't use technology. And that's absolutely not true. They're sort of the second highest group to adopt technology after the young group, after the youngins. It's those of us who are in the middle who are sort of slower. So more than 60% of Americans have smartphones. 60%. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of smartphones. And then there's a lot of people who are smartphone dependent. Smartphone dependence means that's your connection to the Internet. You don't, have, you don't have Internet access at home or other places. That's how you connect to the Internet. That smartphone dependence is highest among people with lower incomes and in education because they don't have the money to do the home the home lines and all this other stuff. So they use their smartphone for internet connections. If you think about how many things in our life are now internet dependent, plane reservations, right? Think about all those things that you try to do. Libraries, I mean, all kinds of things now you require the internet for. So the thing is, is that the smartphone is just, there's gonna be more demand for this. And we haven't really figured out very well yet everything we can do with it for health. So this is from the Pew Research Center. And I know this is maybe a little hard to read, but what I'm trying to point out here is that people 50 plus Use text messaging, internet use, voice and video calls, and the email as much as the younger groups do. And when we actually dig into this even a little deeper, and these are smartphone users, one of the things we know is that there's really sort of two groups of older people. And these are my terms. These are not the Pew terms. So th there are people who are connected, the older people who are connected, and the older people who are disconnected. And it's the digital divide, except if you think about who it is for us, what does this mean? The connected ones are the young people who are younger, higher education, and more affluent. There's no surprises there, right? Who are the disconnected ones? Older, less affluent, health and disability challenges. Who's the home care patient? The disconnected, right? Because they tend to be older and they have health problems. That's why we're seeing them. So I think we have to sort of keep in mind that even though the smartphones and all these things are growing, we still have this digital divide, which is just as big in the older populations as it is in other places. So some of the challenges for um, older people in technology are physical challenges. I don't know about you, but if I take my glasses off, I can't read my phone sometimes, right? And if you have text-based things, that, and there's a lot of text, the font sizes don't work for lots of people. Even if you blow it up, then you can't read it on the screen, and you change in the directions, or you, you do any of that kind of manipulation. It's like juggling. There, then there's skepticism about some of this technology. And those are real concerns. Even though we may have good evidence from the healthcare provider side that there are real things that we can do, there's going to be some skepticism about this because, remember, these are folks who are the digital immigrants, right? They didn't grow up with it like my kids did. And they're a little skeptical about these things. They're worried about privacy, security. Is this accurate? Who can see my information? How do I know it's really you? It's all these things that they're concerned about. And then difficulties learning to use things. So what happens, the interesting piece is, though, what, from the research, once people be get online, these older people get online, they, technology becomes integral to their life. So if you can sort of get them to convert, then you can actually, you can actually get them. A lot of older people, 77% own, own cell phones, but only 18% of those are smartphones. So anything that's a smartphone app is not necessarily going to work for an older population. So I think this is where, so I, you know, I can get really jazzed about some of these good apps, and then I'm like, wait, here's the problem. They're smartphone-based. So it's not the flip phone with the text, right? So they, uh, they asked me to talk about this fitness band study. So one of the things we know is that um, physical activity is really important and beneficial for older people, even people, with, even people with heart failure and other kinds of conditions. We were always concerned about, can we do this, can we do this? So the, the evidence shows that it really is safe. So what we're trying to do is promote physical activity. So one of the things that we're doing here, and this is from a, this is from a study I did with some colleagues in engineering, is we looked at fitness bands. So why were we looking at fitness bands? Because the person, I'll go back here, the person who's second, who j has PhD after his name, Dr. Lin, this was his dissertation study, and he was building a fall sensor. That's pretty cool. 
he was testing it with that. So what we did is he had him wear three fitness bands at the same time to sort of validate his fall sensor. So we're looking at the data and going along, looking at user satisfaction. We actually did it in, in a regular place, not in a, not in a lab, so it was unusual because it was done in a home environment. It wasn't done in a lab. Um, and then we got the data. I'm like, what is going on here? So I'll tell you what happened here. So we had 13 older people wore these three fitness bands for an entire day from the time they woke up until they went to bed. And they also wore Charlie's sensor because he wanted to test his sensor. So why did we do that? We wanted to make sure his sensor was validating and catching things. They wore them all simultaneously because he was concerned about just using one or the other. These have all have proprietary algorithms. So how they count the steps and how they count the calories is a trade secret. We're good with that. We just wanted to see how it worked. So what we did is we looked only at the fitness bands here. So we got the step count from each band. And we got the calorie count. And then we did a falls risk, because I was involved, using the Mac. Because we wanted to see the falls risk piece. We also let the end use the system usability scale to see how well they liked the technology. And then we did the regular demographic stuff. So we had uh, a good range. Our, meeting, our mean age was 83. So we had a pretty good age, unlike some of the other studies where they, if you look at some of these fitness band studies that are done in labs, the mean age is 22. So they're college students, right? So we decided, no, we're going to use older people. Um, half, a little less than half, we had, we had males. I was really glad to see that because a lot of times it's hard to get the guys involved, but we had, we had males. Their falls risk was 3.8. If you look at the, uh, the max score of four, um, more, most of our participants were at risk for falls. Now, these were people who were living in the community, and they were not home health care patients. They were people living in the community. So that made me say, maybe that max scale is set too high. Might need to look at that. So what we did is we looked at the mean number of counts. We looked at the mean number of steps per device. And so I give you the information there. And then mean calorie count. This is interesting, but the, actually the, the graphs are the fun part. So what we looked at is the correlations between the different devices to sort of see how they did. They were all pretty high. But when we looked at it, we're like, some of these step counts were as different as 6,000 steps for the same person. What, that's, I'm like, what? Do we have data error? Charlie, are you sure we, do we, did we do this right? So we went back, and I mean, we, you know, I'm like neurotic, because I'm like, I'm, clearly we made a mistake. No, we didn't make any mistakes. Here's the differences. So you can see that when we compared, like, jawbone and fuel band, it was 1,600 steps different. Jawbone and Fitbit, it was 1,100 steps less. So I'll show you the graphs, just because that's the interesting part. So these are the 13 people. And you can see sort of how they, you know, they sort of like number five. They had the higher steps, but again, there was a lot of difference between those folks. I like number 11, where, you know, and so we're all over the map on this. So, what so here's what we think happened. Then we normalized the step counts. A smaller number is better for, so we did this thing called coefficient of variation, and a smaller number is better. Um, Fitbit had the lowest coefficient of variation. However, I'm not making a recommendation. We only had 13 people. It's not enough to draw conclusions, okay? Especially with that much step variation. Then we looked at calories. Even worse, it looks like, looks like something a kindergartner wrote, right? It's all over. So, so we're saying for sure on the, when we normalize the data and then the calorie counting, you can see that it was like, look at this difference. Not even close, right? So don't, in other words, our message on this is don't use this for calorie counting among older people. So then, we, of course, we couldn't leave well enough alone. So then part of the thing is, is how many steps did they actually take? Well, we don't know. We weren't with them all day. So we said we could, we could record them and count the steps. So this is the one. We just started this one. I just got the first eight subjects. So we actually videotaped people walking. We could then go back and count the steps while they were wearing the three devices. All right? So... For three of the older people, the bands registered 0 to 18 steps when they actually took somewhere between 79 and 133. They were using walkers. So they weren't picking up this, right? All right, accelerometer, right? It doesn't pick this up. Canes, on the other hand, were fine. And actually more accurate based on these first eight. So we're, we're continuing on here on this stuff. Um, but the walker thing. So if you have somebody who wears a fitness band and they're using a walker, it's not working. And that makes sense. And then people like me who like do this, I can get thousands of steps a day <laughs> without actually having to take any, you see. So, <laughs> so um, this is, again, this is one of the things that, so these folks were, um, and again, these were volunteers, and they were very excited about being involved with this. They were very anxious because some of them said, you know, I've been thinking about getting one of those or asking for one for my birthday. Should I do that? 
And so, you know, so it actually helps to have this kind of data to actually help guide some of those decisions. So our bottom line is physical activity is indeed good for people, and everything they do is good, but I don't know that I'd be putting a lot of credence in some of these step counters yet. So. And there's my contact information. Thank you. How are they doing on time? Am I okay? All right, good afternoon. I'm Alan Bugos from Phillips Home Monitoring, also known as Phillips Lifeline. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I should first mention I'm very new to the healthcare industry. Um, I'm also very new to, to uh, Phillips. Um, I just joined the company recently. Um, I'm an engineer and a technologist. My background is primarily uh, around uh, real-time internet-based communications and technologies, video, uh, sensors, hardware, um, and what, what's really exciting me about being at Philips and working specifically in the home is um, the ability to create what we call the Internet of Health Things. Now, I know Liz mentioned the Internet of Things, and there's also the Internet of Everything, um, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to lead and, um, and help with what I call the Internet of Health Things. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I'm going to speak a little bit more on predictive analytics. But um, in general, I'll say a few words about the healthcare landscape, of which this is all fairly common knowledge. I'll, I'll touch a little bit on um, home monitoring, um, where things are happening there, telehealth, um, and then also get into um, some of the platforms. These are the, the, the platforms that um, are open yet secure. They're uh, HIPAA, HIPAA compliant. And, and this is where we, I think we have the ability to um, use that actionable data that's being collected from all these hundreds of thousands of devices um, to break down the big data into little data that's actionable that can be used um, uh, to, um, uh, for many different things. And I'll say a few words about what we're doing around a product called CareSage. Um, th this uh, obviously is healthcare today. Um, no need to go into details here. Um, some of these slides were um, assisted um, by others in my company. Obviously, the growth in healthcare costs are things we have to address. Um, the prevalence of chronic conditions, aging population, um, specifically by 2013. We all know where this is going in terms of um, aging, but the, the key thing is we want to age uh, gracefully, healthily aging I in our homes, and, and this is where um, we focus. Um, this obviously is the uh, acuity uh, triangle. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this and very well aware of the various tiers of uh, populations around population health, and then obviously what's driving uh, the cost share within those tiers. So um, these are just examples of you know where we may need to focus um, potential technology solutions for reducing those costs. So um, some of the solutions, obviously, the comp complex care management. Um, the focus is monitoring daily vital signs, surveys and education, technology can help here. Um, population health management, um, where you have frequent um, check-ins per week, um, limited vitals and clinic clinical status, um, again, driven by um, certain technologies. And then there's wellness monitoring and um, worried well as well. Um, these are um, obviously folks who are a little more um, um, in much better shape in terms of their health and wellness. Um, and again, um, we're all very familiar with the healthcare continuum, the uh, future landscape of care delivery, um, where you start out with healthy living, obviously promoting that, driving that through technology, through apps or uh, sensors, activity monitoring. Um, um, then you get into prevention, diagnosis, treatment, recovery, and home care. Um, in terms of um, the stages of phases for, um, of the uh, aging journey, um, here's where you kind of have a challenge with respect to um, Betty, who's the senior, um, and her level of um, independence um, starts to de decline with respect to noticing changes, denial, 
um, obviously making adjustments, significant change, and then being overwhelmed. Um, on, um, on the caregiver side, Sarah, for example, um, there's a level of burden that goes with that um, as Betty's independence changes, as um, her aging process changes. So um, you can see that there is some assistance that's needed. This is where obviously telehealth, um, uh, home monitoring, home care systems can uh, significantly help um, both participants there. Then you also have the HCOs and the clinicians involved as well. So um, where home monitoring uh, transformation, um, I, I wasn't going to really talk about the smart home per se, but I'd love to uh, address that maybe perhaps in the question and answer because this is, um, again, what excites me about um, having a, um, a connected home that um, allows for um, the uh, ability and application of just healthy living, um, living well, um, you know, having all these capabilities um, to continue to promote wellness. Obviously, safety, if we're looking at the um, aging seniors, um, we obviously want to know that our loved ones are protected um, in and out of the home, obviously. Um, there is mobility, but uh, again, um, being able to know and understand in real time what's happening uh, through a sensor-based system, perhaps, and the ability to get help um, when an intervention or a critical need arises. And then, obviously, the connectedness. Um, as we talk about the Internet of Things, um, everybody has wireless technology. Everyone, for the most part, has broadband. But, um, you know, this also tied with social networking, um, with the ability to sense and collect data, and also drive that into um, either portals, um, applications, or more specifically, predictive analytics or analytic engines that can do that automated um, calculation and provide those risk scores is very powerful. Um, in terms of hospital to home, um, this is just one example where um, you go from the ICU, um, where you have uh, critical and acute care programs, um, various telehealth uh, technologies, and then as they transition into a tailored ambulatory care uh, practice in the home, uh, again, the continuance of various connected technologies and back-end systems will uh, aid. And I think this kind of goes to what some of the other um, speakers were talking about um, in terms of interworking, interoperability, and more specifically workflow. So, you know, having systems that, um, that are interconnected in, in a likeness or um, by bringing in third-party systems is kind of a key goal that, you know, we need to consider from an IT development perspective. And again, this is just another slide that, that talks a little bit more about uh, each of these different areas within uh, the telehealth spectrum uh, across from the hospital into the home. Um, these are just some of the solutions that um, are provided um, specifically by, um, by Philips. And um, obviously, um, more of these are becoming connected. Um, that is a, a key goal, I think, for any vendor now. And it's a bi your ability to do that is becoming um, very um, vast and significant because um, what we call silicon on a chip or the ability to embed a very small uh, micro sensor um, is very easy to do. Um, it generates data, useful data, sometimes data that's not useful or too much data, but it's having that back end where you can make sense of all of it is very critical. Again, um, uh, tele um, telehealth, Home monitoring systems are also changing. Um, you're seeing more uh, wireless devices. So obviously one of the biggest um, um, complications of, of operating this in the home is um, setting this up, um, keeping it um, operational, and the most important thing is um, ease of use. But um, as things move more to a wireless model um, where you have um, very low-cost connected devices, um, this becomes much, much easier. Um, we're moving more from, you know, computer-based um, technology to what we call mobile phone, or more specifically, tablets. Um, tablets are, I think, the sweet spot specifically for um, aging seniors, where you can have very simple graphical-based user, user interfaces, very simple inputs, essentially pressing the button and um, getting the, uh, the monitoring done. 
I think the other kind of key capability here, um, because tablets and the use of tablets in, in seniors, I know my parents use them as well, and they love them, it's, it's great, is the ability to do um, real-time um, social networking or more specifically real-time uh, video and audio in interaction. So um, with um, a number of, of changes in technologies in terms of real-time video and audio communication, this is very possible now. And um, this not only connects um, um, the, um, the, the subscribers or the ANG seniors, seniors to their, their clinicians or their caregivers, but also has the, cap the capability to um, interact with loved ones, to check in daily, to get um, a good sense of what's going on. And as Liz was talking about in terms of the smart home, just imagine that, you know, if you had visibility um, from a caregiver perspective or from a loved one perspective to see, wow, the temperature's fine, um, they've gone and um, had, um, they've gone to use the uh, refrigerator, um, obviously, you can't get extreme granularity, but it's getting to that point where you'll get a good sense of what's happening within the home environment and knowing that your loved ones are, are um, safe. Um, and again, um, keeping the mind healthy, um, video education, um, also puzzles, games, cognitive um, exercises are all part of, of, of the capabilities with uh, inter internet-based technologies that are all part of the telehealth, telehealth suite. Um, in terms of um, managing population over populations over the year, um, we're um, looking at the visibility into the white space. And I, I think the white space, obviously, is, is this area here um, where you have a, a hospital stay. Um, it could be shorter or avoided. Um, you're looking at home health care within the 30 to 60 day window. But in the white space, um, this is where um, up to 25% of the frail an elderly population may move into um, a higher risk on a yearly basis. So having more visibility into um, that um, area through um, the ability to collect some data, um, uh, important data, um, and even more data in and around the environment is, is very important. So then in the back end systems, you can uh, provide real time uh, alerts, you can do risk calculations, you can do predictive analytics and um, provide a very different outcome um, based on that information. So we've been working on um, this concept called CareSage. Um, it's a population management in, in, uh, enabled by um, what's called our Health Suite digital platform. Um, and um, this, this digital um, Health Suite digital platform has been uh, very powerful because um, it is the building block to uh, collect all of the, the big data, the data that we have now more specifically um, as part of this program, which is focusing more specifically on the frail and, and elderly. Um, it's currently utilizing some of the years of data that we have on fall, dete uh, fall detection, the auto alert detection. And so we're taking that data and, and making it actionable to, to um, look at um, predictive analytics specific to uh, the risk of, of, um, of fall, fall detection. Um, with respect to the Health Suite digital platform, um, this is where um, you start looking at various interworking and interoperability um, and also um, trying to focus a little bit more on, on workflows as well. So here's where um, you have open APIs um, that um, anyone can develop uh, to uh, or from, depending on where the data flows. Um, it integrates patient and consumer data as needed. And these are all cloud-based, based, um, open yet secure uh, HIPAA compliant pa platforms. Um, just looking at some of the data that, um, that we and perhaps others have been able to collect, um, there's just um, a, a whole bunch that can be done on, on some of the devices and systems um, that um, we've been able to look at over a number of years. What we've been focusing, uh, oh, I'll just say one more thing about the, uh, the digital health platform. Um, again, this um, provides the ability to um, look at um, uh, all of this data um, and do the risk analysis through various platforms, either on mobile tablets or um, computer-based devices. Um, helping the home healthcare providers, um, looking at um, 
better views for cl clinicians, and then obviously HCOs, those who are paying for these uh, services. I'm going to skip over this, um, but uh, to the uh, very far right, um, what part of this does is it provides the, um, the analytics engines for um, creating uh, dashboards and, and benchmark tools. Um, there's a uh, ability to do real-time alerts and reminders. Um, it also has workflow uh, engines, which are very critical. These are also customizable. And then you have multiple data interfaces um, uh, to and from uh, the integration points within the platform uh, back out to those who need the data. And um, again, this is sort of a high-level um, flow of where you're combining um, various bits of, of data. Um, we've got 40 years. We've been saying that we've had wearable technology for the last 40 years. Um, a lot of that data is um, available now and, and can be driven into this um, system so that we can do uh, predictive analytics specifically for those who are at risk to fall. So here's just an example of a, a patient risk prediction report. So um, going through all the, the different analytics, you can uh, get a sense of uh, patients with risk for transport um, and uh, the various scores that are presented here. Um, this is obviously trying to reduce um, any kind of uh, um, issue within um, over the next 30 days um, after um, outpatient care. The um, population risk report, um, this is just another example um, of, of where um, you might be able to use some of this data here. Um, this reports patients at risk in the home who can benefit from um, various solutions uh, for, um, for use in, in the home. And, and again, this is just a uh, quick roadmap of our frail and elderly pa uh, program. Um, specifically um, where the, the Tier 1 through 4 uh, programs are um, prevalent in the white spaces I described earlier. And then lastly, just some um, uh, key takeaways that um, we're um, at, the, at the point where you know, we can collect um, much of the data um, through um, various forms, through EMRs, through uh, devices, wearables, and sensors. And um, these can all be brought back into um, healthcare informatics systems uh, for processing and, and driving out uh, key and actionable results. So, thank you. even tighter for some of us. <laughs> How's everybody holding up? Good. One last person before potty break, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll watch for fidgeting to see uh, how we're doing on time. Um, as was mentioned, my name's Chris Taylor. Um, in the in the remote, I, I, never, I never have to, I always talk so loud. Um, in the last 10 years, uh, actually now 13 years, pretty much my, my focus has really been in the remote patient monitoring world. I spent five years running uh, home ed in the early 2000 era, went to the EMR world, but worked, uh, the company I was with worked very closely and had a, a relationship with Philips for about four years. And then in the last uh, almost four years have been running the commercial side um, for CardioCom. So I have a kind of a wide range. And so information I put together and I was asked by um, VNA was to look at technology and, and where's technology going and, and what are some of the things we can watch for. Um, and so I, I, in my research, found some pretty cool technology, the piano for the bedridden, uh, the Flowbee, uh, the DeLorean. You all remember the DeLorean? What, what, what do all three of these things have in common? They all failed miserably, right? And one of the things that I think when we look at technology we have to think about is um, what are we really doing? Who are our customers? And in this room, um, I think most of us, when we think of our customers, we think of the patients um, and the people we take care of daily. Um, I, I would put out, um, and Rich brought it up in, in his discussion with being a home care agency trying to provide um, also a relationship with hospitals in his area. And for those that aren't directly associated to a hospital, 
those are also customers. Um, and, and you need to have that partnership. Even those that, of you that are associated with hospitals, I can tell you, when I sit with the CMOs and the CEOs, um, they'll go to whoever is going to provide them the best services and outcomes, um, whether it's inside or, or outside. So for those that aren't associated, don't get, don't get nervous or, or think that's a barrier, because the bottom line is if you can show them that you can do it better, um, they, they would love to, to go into relationships with you especially when it comes to some of the things we'll talk about um, today. Bottom line is when we look at technology, um, the it, gentleman from Intel, I mean, the bottom line was we need to create stuff that people really want. And we can create anything. But when you think about your services that you provide and your relationships that you're in business for, and when you look at technology, it has to be for what those individuals really want. Um, the previous three that I gave, some of those really didn't get it. Um, it wasn't what the people wanted, and thus they're not around anymore. Um, the other thing that needs to be usable, usability, um, Liz had a, in, in one of her studies talked about usability scale. It has to be usable, uh, and in fact, usability they find is the most critical feature and factor in if a technology um, brings benefit. Um, and so you need to think about, again, the patients. Um, we talked about how uh, the, the disconnected patients that we deal with. The majority of our patients don't have T1 lines going to their homes. Um, a lot of them don't even have Wi-Fi in their homes. Again, is that disconnected group that was talked about previously is those elderly patients that we're taking care of that might not have some of those things. So we still need to provide technology that fits and is usable for them. And uh, as Albert Camus, one of the Nobel Prize winners mentioned, it's if we can get it to the point where it's easy enough that a child can use, that's when adoption and, and those type of things move very, very quickly with, um, with technology. So as we look at usability, really we want to get to where it's intuitively easy to use, that it's appropriate to the task, and that it accommodates their needs. So as we look at where we sit today as in-home health providers, um, what are some of the things that are appropriate to the task? Well, we know that there's an ever-changing um, situation in the, in the healthcare continuum. One is, in the acute care market, CMS, um, a couple years ago, started this. Um, we can either give them a carrot with reimbursement dollars, or we can use a stick. Well, they decided to go with the stick, and they put this um, process in place that every year they were going to increase their penalty, and then not only that, but increase the penalty percentage in the hospital world, but also increase the number of disease conditions that they get penalized for. So for those that don't know, um, cabbage is being added, uh, will be the next group um, for FY17. Um, but in FY15, we had a big, there was a big change. Um, the biggest change that we've seen in FY15 was with the addition of COPD and total hip, total knee. One of the interesting pieces to that is total hip, total knee took over as the number one pain point for hospitals in, in, in the United States from a chargeback, CMS chargeback, and how to deal with 30-day readmit. Most organizations and programs that you all have probably focus on heart failure. Um, that's in, in home care um, around for the last 13 years. That's pretty much what we focused on. But your customer's pain point is maybe a different disease state, maybe something different that um, they're really hurting about. Um, where the chargebacks that they're getting paid um, and hit from CMS is almost twice as big. Well, it is twice as big as, as the next one. Um, so if you, if you don't or haven't thought about putting together a post-hip, post-knee specific program and using technologies, i.e. remote patient monitoring, to help do that, to, to put yourself in a place to help relieve this pain, I would go back and, and sit with your team and think about what can we do. One of the things we know is that, just for this example, and, and there's these dollars for, for all of the different ones, but when you look at a hospital and, and those organizations, it's not just the chargeback that they get hit on, but if you look at aver a, a, an average cost for surgical infection, it's a $20,000 hit. Well, if you can help reduce that one um, charge, there's a lot of things that there's a lot of contracted in-home visits they could give to you to help them do that. Same thing with um, a lot of people when they look at art failure, they think, 
And some of you probably look at the, the, if you know the hospitals in your area, what their chargeback is, and you say, oh, well, I don't have any hospitals that are really getting charged back for heart failure. The reality is, if you look at heart failure admissions into a hospital, almost every hospital in the United States loses money on a heart failure admission. Not the CMS penalties, but just having a patient go back into the hospital. So they're really looking for us as an as, as industry to figure out how we can help them reduce that and use technology. And the bottom line is we have current technology that we already have, how can we expand? For example, several of you raised hands that I already have a, a, a telehealth remote patient monitoring that's focused on heart failure. We'll look at expanding that program into some of these other areas such as post-hit, post-knee, or COPD, some of these other penalties areas, um, AMI, uh, pneumonia, areas, be ahead of the game. Start putting one together for post-cabbage, you know? So you can go in and talk to them about, hey, look, FY17, you're going to be on the hook for post-cabbage. Let's look at, you know, putting together a program on and helping you reduce that. The other is improved technologies. What technologies are already in the market that the, that the industry is looking at improving? And then the last is new technologies. Studies, we, we talked about that a little earlier with studies. There's studies over, you know, um, individual, I just threw seven little ones up on the board, but over and over again, organizations that, that implement, and I saw this at each of the organizations that I've worked with over the last 13 years, if a program is put together properly, you can have impact on reduction of, of readmission. Um, another big one that a lot of people don't look at and, and don't really focus on, which again, I would recommend you, you think about, is helping these partners that you're, you're looking to, to better yourself with and helping them reduce length of stay. Um, an average day in a hospital is somewhere between $1,500 to $2,000. Um, average length of stay for a heart failure patients about five days in a hospital. You can, you can get the, the data to see where they are. If you can help cut a half a day, you can more than cover um, any, any services that you would provide them and, and they would they would love to have you be able to help in that area. The VA study, Renee mentioned the, the VA. The VA has done the largest um, study. Now a lot of people say, oh, they're a closed system, all those type of things. Reality is they still have elderly population that have comorbid issues, um, that live, a lot of them live alone, um, or if they don't have a home care uh, a provider um, in the home, but similar situations. The patient population, the actual user of the technology, is it's very, it's very similar. Just because they're in the VA, they're not some special person. Um, so when you come down to does remote patient monitoring work, if it works for a patient in the VA, there's no reason for it not to work. In fact, um, you know the VA gets about 700 to 800 monitors shipped to their their patients, um, remote patient monitors weekly. Um, that go to their front door and they set it up themselves. It goes back to that usability. You have to have something that's easy to use um, so it can be that, you know, at that level. But again, if you look at their, their outcomes, 38% reduction in emissions, 58% uh, reduction in bed days, while still having high patient satisfaction. So the, the, the studies are out there, the data is there. Um, as I mentioned, looking at expanding the current program, Several of you raise your hands that you have a current program. I would recommend that you look at, again, most of you also probably would state if you looked at the overall percentage of patients in your program, I would I'd have a $100 bill, I'd bet on it, that the majority of the patients in your program are, are specifically looked at heart failure. And so if you have a program that's working helping reduce 30-day readmits on heart failure, I would recommend when you go back and sit with your teams, you look at the others, AMI, pneumonia, COPD, post-hip, post-knee, and then as you move forward to FY17 post cabbage, because again, your partners that you're trying to become customers and build relationships with would love it if you could help them in these areas. So same technology, but we're expanding the, the scale and, and the scope of how many patients you can influence um, with that. Post hit, post knee, a lot of people are like, oh, how, you know, what, what can we do in, in home health? But studies have shown that, that the best place to rehab um, actually is in the home and much more benefit comes from the rehab process um, done by home health organizations and, and in in home um, settings so there are things that we can do from a program standpoint improve technologies one of the things we do is is we can get things smaller so 
Some of the things they talked about earlier that they said we're going to be, you know, are coming out, they're already out. Um, so this is a uh, is kind of like the old Holter, you know, the Holter and event recorders you had to wear outside and hook a bunch of leads and make sure leads didn't come off. Um, this device actually is an, it's it's um, before they actually will do an implant of a of a pacemaker or a defibrillator. They'll this is a, basically a event recorder. But it's 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 implanted, um, and, and it's been out for probably 15 years now. Um, now, what they've done, as you can see, the little guy right there, they've made it a lot smaller. This is it, um, and it's not an implantable anymore. Now it's just insertion; just gets inserted. In fact, who, do I have a volunteer? I can show you how easy it is to insert it under your skin. <laughs> Nobody. Basically, they just there's a little a little tool that it goes in. They just make a little poke right under the skin. They slide it in, and it lasts three years. This little guy has a battery that will last three years, that will record arterial fibrillation. It, it does all the cardiac information, and these are going in the patients today. You might have patients that have this in. This isn't futuristic. This is this has been going out for a while now. So, um, the exciting thing about that is is then being able to take this data again. The whole idea of technology, sorry, you're probably bugging me. You're like back there shaking his head. I'm all over the place with the microphone. Um, but the whole idea of using technology is let's get the right information to the right people at the right time so we can do right uh, in interventions and education so we can get our right outcomes, right? That's the whole goal of why remote patient monitoring ever came about. So now we can take little devices like this that are already can be put in in a cath lab, in, in a cath lab waiting room, really. Put it in, put a little sterile strip after, and you're done. Um, and then take that information and send it remotely to a clinician and again use algorithms to be able to use the data to predict if there's issues not just to send over millions of beats of you know QRS complexes but actually put it into an algorithm that says hey if they're having impedance demography issues at the same time as an AF at the same time we know that there's a high probability of an event now we can do those type of things. Um, and so those are some of the things where we're improving on technologies that we've had for a while, but we're even making them smaller and easier so it doesn't have to, you don't have to go under anesthesia or anything like that to reduce, again, infection, reduce those type of things. And then it's, let's look at new technologies. What can we do with new technologies? So patients that have infrequent heart issues, um, this guy's great. And it lasts for three years, so you can put it in because you don't know when it's going to happen if you want to catch it. This is even easier. This is basically an oversized Band-Aid that has all the same information, and they just put it on the chest. And they can last for 30 days. And so patients that have frequent um, cardiac issues, um, they'll slap this on, collects that data, and again, that data can be analyzed by clinicians to, uh, to know what's going on with those patients. Um, it's wireless, it's water resistant, they don't have to do anything, no batteries, it's, it's very easy. So looking at future technology, um, again, this is going on patients today. It's not futuristic, it's, it's done and it's, it's out there. Um, one of the exciting things about this is the thing, if you think about predictive approach to, to clinical <coughs> outcomes, on a standard um, remote patient monitor, have them step on a scale, you have them do their blood pressure, have them do their SpO2, ask them some symptomatic questions. If it's cardiac, uh, heart failure patient, maybe feet and ankle more swollen, shortness of breath, those type of things. And usually you can predict about two to three days at most using those type of things of, of when there's going to be a negative effect. Um, with these technologies, we're almost out to six days before. So an average of 5.8 days uh, of initial detect um, detection to a clinical uh, relevant arrhythmia. So now what we're doing is we're pushing out that lead time to do intervention, to do education and those type of things. So again, the end result being reduction of readmission, reduction of, of other issues, length of stay, those type of things. Um, bottom line is, got to make sure that the technologies are out there just because it's like we talked about that how many apps are coming out. Apps aren't always the answer because if, if it's a bogus app, it's, you know, the worst thing we can do is create false positives. Um, and so we got to make sure that it, it's what we really need. It's easy to use. 
Again, we got to think of our patient population. The average mean was 83 on yours. Um, that they can do it. If the VA is drop shipping that many um, and they're doing it on their first, I mean, they're doing it by themselves with nobody helping them. Um, and then also to look at technology, expanding what you might have already invested in. If you've already invested in it, that would be the first thing I'd recommend. Two is looking at the companies are looking at how can we improve what's already out there. And lastly, what, what we can look at in the, in the horizon.